All right. Hi, everyone. Hello. Oh. Anton, uh, thanks, for, thanks for agreeing to do this. It's uh, great to have you. Miroslav, oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Miroslav usually does the introduction, so I don't want to take the honor. <laughs> okay. So, welcome, everyone, tonight, today. Uh, today, we are happy to have Anton Seitlin, who's going to tell us about the geometry of beta equations and Q operators. So, we are happy to have you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And uh, as you see, the storm passed and it's sunny in Louisiana <laughs> right now. So uh, I will talk about uh, different geometric facets you have with beta equations and integrable models. And let me start from uh, bringing in uh, the quote from the, the great one, uh, Artie Feynman, how he was fascinated by this uh, two-dimensional models uh, and how they're solved by beta and that's and how mysteriously they jump out at you and work out. So they keep mysteriously jumping us, these models which are sold by beta and that's, and now they're jumping from geometry. Let me give you uh, a bit of a timeline just to bring everybody on equal ground here. Uh, so the first glimpse of uh, you know, beta and that's and uh, exact solutions of uh, integrable models, it started in the 1930s by Hans Bett, and before that it was, I believe, the work of Bloch. Uh, and uh, then uh, the first algebraic structures appeared in the 60s and 70s by Young and Baxter, where Young Baxter equation and Baxter operator appeared, the first algebraic structures, but they were not never understood until 1980s uh, with uh, the development of the quantum inverse scattering method by Leningrad School, and uh, then led to the discovery of quantum groups. So now uh, all these integrable models are successfully understood. Uh, using quantum groups. And now it's a textbook subject, although unfortunately for the mathematics community, there is still no available good subject uh, describing beta and that and so on. So people have to learn it from physics textbooks or articles. So let me talk about this uh, two geometric facets I, uh, I will discuss. So the first one I will describe briefly uh, in this talk. Uh, but uh, this is where, you know, the great progress happened in uh, recent uh, years. So uh, this is enumerative geometry. And uh, uh, first, integrable structures in enumerative geometry is due to uh, 90s, uh, starting from words of the Brodin and Beaton, and then, then uh, the relation of integrability and enumerative geometry explicitly, uh, it was uh, manifested in the words of Gibenthal, where he brought quantum many body systems into, into the study. And there was, uh, I believe in his paper, there were suggestions that quantum groups should naturally appear, of course. Uh, but uh, the really fascinating progress happened in the last uh, you know, decade. It was by Oblenkov and his school. And uh, this was a, a different approach to quantum homology and quantum key theory, uh, which you know, used the full um, power of quantum group and the decrypable structures and, and so on and so on. And I gave you a couple of references here which are useful. So, but that wouldn't, wouldn't be the main subject of today's talk. What, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, something else. It's, in a way, it's a more uh, easier uh, geometric interpretation. So, it is motiv motivated by uh, the classical limit of that, which was known again from 90s and beginning of the thousands, uh, studied by uh, Edward Penkel uh, and his collaborators. So there is a famous example of uh, geometric Langlands correspondence, which brings together Gaudin models, which are like the limit, almost like the classical version of, uh, uh, you know, beta and that's, uh, models solved by beta and that's, and uh, connections on a projective line with certain singularities. So uh, in this talk, I will, I mean, main, main topic will be Q deformation of uh, that construction, right? And there are a couple of references I wanted to bring in. So this is based on work with uh, Peter and Ben Sage and uh, Edward Frankl. Uh, so here is an uh, outline. So first, I will remind you just to bring everybody on equal ground what, uh, how these integrable models are related to quantum groups and beta and that's very briefly. And then I will talk about, again, briefly about this approach on uh, quantum equivalent key theory and beta and that's for integrable models based on quantum groups. 
And then I will switch to uh, kind of the main topic. I will bring uh, this uh, object, which appeared long ago and uh, later was fully investigated QQ systems. And I will uh, describe uh, how it appears from the classical theory. And then we're gonna just, we're gonna talk about uh, the deformed orders and their interaction with QQ systems. And later on, uh, I hope there will be enough time, we will talk about some applications and uh, in the end, in the end, I will talk about uh, few authors for toroidal algebras, which is quite surprising, uh, surprising thing. So let me start from something uh, very, very simple. So how do we look now at uh, uh, integrable models based on quantum groups? So let's start from some Lie algebra G for most of the talk. Uh, Lie algebra G will be uh, considered to be, uh, you know, simple, simple Lie algebra. Let's look at the loop algebra, the corresponding loop algebra. Uh, and then we can talk about the family of representations called evaluation models, which are induced by representations of the Lie algebra itself. Right? So uh, there are uh, parameters, which are very important evaluation parameters, which stand for you know, the values of T, the loop parameter. Right? So this is a tensor category. But then what happens, you can deform standard category, so you can introduce the R matrix, uh, uh, which, which is, appears to be non-trivial intertwiner. It was trivial before, but now it's, it's a non-trivial intertwiner satisfying Young-Baxter equation. And uh, this intertwiner is a rational function of A1 and A2. So in this case, it's known as trigonometric R matrix because in physics, for some reasons, there is, a, you know, you, you talk about instead of A1, you represent it exponential and therefore becomes represented using uh, trigonometric functions. All right, and the elements of the quantum groups, they appear as matrix elements of uh, the R matrices. So now let's talk about integrability and what it is and how, how it emerges from here. So now um, let's look at something um, which is fixed. So let's fix one model of the tensor category uh, and let's call it H physical, the physical space. And let's introduce another model, which can be auxiliary. So H physical space is fixed. The auxiliary model W, so W is, uh, sorry. This is auxiliary model and uh, uh, H physical, it's fixed, it's fixed. So uh, now, uh, let's look at this R matrix and apply to it the permutation operator so that it can not mix up uh, the model there and uh, take a trace with respect to auxiliary model. Then you get something what is called transfer matrix associated to that auxiliary, auxiliary representation W of Q, where U will be now known as spectral parameter. We can refer to that as spectral parameter. Also, what is present there, it's uh, the weight Z. Again, very important uh, object, uh, which belongs to Cartan, Cartan uh, subgroup. And uh, again, keep it in mind, it can be very, very important. So this is transfer matrix. And integrability is something what you uh, get uh, from Young-Baxter equation, the fact that uh, this transfer matrix is a commute. Now there are special transfer matrices called Baxter Q operators. So they generate the whole Baxter algebra, the algebra of this uh, transfer matrices. Uh, just to remind you, transfer matrices, they act in that space, H phys, right? So then primary goal for physicists is to diagonal, diagonalize these transfer matrices simultaneously, right? So here is a textbook example. So this is H physical, the, uh, the elementary example for SL2. So this is a product of, um, C2 spaces. So each, if you if you denote elements in the basis as arrows pointing up and down, spin up and down. So this is how you can you can uh, label the basis in a space, right? And then there is a method, uh, an old method, how the, to diagonalize transfer matrices. It's known as algebraic Betanzats. So that's a part of quantum linear scattering method developed in the 80s. Uh, and uh, what it leads to, well, in this particular case, let me give you the first uh, Betanzatz equations. So it leads to uh, searching the solutions of these uh, algebraic equations. 
And that Q operator, remember I told you about this Q operator, which generates the whole uh, beta algebra. So it, uh, this operator has eigenvalues uh, corresponding to, uh, you know, the, the eigenvalues uh, give you the generating function for elementary symmetric functions of solutions of beta equation. So the problem here is actually uh, for general G to describe a Q operator uh, from a point of view of representation theory, what W corresponds to that Q operator? Professor, may I ask a yes. question? Yes. Is there a relation between U and the spectral parameter T you wrote down earlier? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, uh, somehow, uh, uh, let me return back to that. So uh, T, remember that T corresponds to evaluation parameter, right? In this uh, representation space. So now U, where it appears. This, it appears in the auxiliary, in auxiliary model, right? This is where we take the trace. I see. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is Q operator. Now here I'm being, uh, I'm a little bit sloppy because you have to sort of rescale that operator by certain function, but let me sweep it under the carpet to, to get those eigenvalues, so you have to rescale it somehow. Okay, so the modern approach to just to, yeah. For the previous question, you you said something like, okay, the main question is blah. What's the main question? Well, maybe I uh, misinterpreted uh, something. Sorry. So the the main question was to diagonalize the transfer matrices sure. and to. to to find, uh, to find uh, the eigenvalues that are described by beta ansatz. Uh, and um, here is a Q operator. And uh, the question was to find uh, genetic, uh, to find, to find the, the representation theoretic interpretation of the Q operator. So which W corresponds to that, okay. that operator Q. So maybe that's what I, I meant. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. So uh, now the more modern view on uh, uh, beta ansatz equations is to look at different equations known as quantum Nizhnik homology equations. So uh, this is uh, what we are solving it to, with respect to. So we are looking at uh, functions with, uh, you know, with values. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The reason I'm stopping you is uh, the, the construction of transfer matrices, the way you describe the fact that they give commuting operators is, is a standard fact, right? Yeah. Um, your question is, can we find, a, a, you'd like a transfer matrix because eigenvalues are given by this Q operator. I mean, by the formula you wrote, right? Yeah. yeah. I see. So, so Q operators, uh, this is, I'm a little bit going ahead of the train here, but but uh, you know the proper description of the Ws, the auxiliary spaces, which where you take the trace to to find Q operator, right? Uh, th 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 that was constructed by Frankel and Hernandez, and it was quite recent. Okay, so, I see. So, uh, but string theory also gives you a canonical construction of such a thing. Mm. Not the model, not the model over oh, the actual operator. I mean. Uh, what, what is the origin of the Baxter Q operator? There's a canonical answer to that that comes from string theory in principle. This is why I'm stopping you. So I wonder whether this connection has been made. I mean, can you explicitly, explicitly construct the model for the quantum group where you take the trace um, and obtain uh, the Q operator this way from string theory? Um, the, the, the actual operator that, that, that gives rise to the W that will give you that Q matrix is known on, so this is on some, you know, it, it is known on sort of physics grounds, right? Okay, no, I, I, I understand that. Papers, you, you will explain to us this connection. So now you yes, also- Yes, I will explain later so from the point of enumerative geometry. I will explain how it appears with its, you know, that it can be constructed using the exterior powers of the you know, tautological bundles, if that is what you refer to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let me return back to QKZ equations. So this is one of the ways to approach the problem. So you consider this difference equations with, uh, you know, for the functions with values in, uh, you know, h -fees again. Uh, and uh, there are also different analyti analyticity regions here. So here I'm writing down the Z analyticity region. 
uh, uh, but you can uh, turn it around and usually it's actually considered in a analyticity region so you can re-expand it either with respect to z or with respect to a and this is kind of uh, um, it's related to what i'm going to talk about it later a little bit uh, so and here is the equation and uh, the point is what you see in the right hand side is actually uh, called uh, non-local hamiltonians for these models and they commute the right hand side commutes with with uh, transfer matrices. So as a result, when you take Q to, 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 to unit, right? So you, you obtain the eigenvalue problem. And uh, therefore studying the asymptotics of the solutions of this equation give you better equations just like that. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ways how better equations appear in more canonical way than this sort of uh, little bit old algebraic better than that construction. And, uh, this approach is related to what I talked, as I said, I'm going to talk about it briefly. Uh, so this uh, string theoretic interpretation of uh, I mean, I will say about it. And uh, it's related to conjecture uh, of Nikasov and Stashvili from 2009 through 3D gauge theory. Again, it's sort of uh, folklore statement with quantum K theory ring of Nakajima variety. This is symmetric polynomials in, you know, beta roots. Right, it can be described using symmetric polynomials and better roots. So how uh, how does it appear? So it comes from uh, how to interpret it mathematically. So uh, in the papers of Akunkov and Akunkov and Smirnov, so there was uh, it was discovered that uh, there is a Q difference equations, namely QKZ equations and uh, extra equations, dynamical equations, which I skipped decided not to talk about it. So they uh, appear. Uh, through the study of uh, quasi map moduli spaces to Nakajima varieties. So, uh, these parameters which we uh, uh, met before, uh, parameter Q in the equation and also evaluation parameters, they appear in these cases equivalent parameters. And let me illustrate it on a simple example. So, I decided to devote one page to this simple example of T star Grassmannian. So uh, notice there are parameters k and n here. So n, remember that n is the number of our evaluation parameters. And uh, uh, what happens there that uh, our evaluation parameters, they correspond to equivalent parameters of the torus acting on t star cross uh, And k is uh, just the weight. Uh, it will correspond to the weight in uh, the corresponding spin chain. So how does it, how does it work? Well, if you look, oh my God, what's going on? It looks like my tablet decided to shut down. Ah, here you go. Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so, I meant to say, don't worry, take your time. Yeah. Sorry about this. It's uh, technical issues. So, we didn't take Zoom. Yeah, so let me turn back to this example. So uh, as I explained to you, so there is a, a torus acting on... Um, and then we don't see your slides. No? The screen again, yes. Ah, so I lost Zoom, I see.
Okay. Uh, Peter, you have to enable screen sharing. Yeah, it should work now. It should work, okay. Okay, I think it's on. Yes, uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, okay, fantastic. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so where did I stop? So let, let's look at uh, this example of T-Strike Rasmanian and uh, these equivalent parameters, uh, which were evaluation parameters, they act uh, on uh, they're exactly n of them, and they act on T-Strike Rasmanian, and we consider the equivalent key theory with respect to that. And this equivalent key theory, it is generated by tautological bundles on t star Grassmannian. Right? So you can, uh, using the Shure function, you construct all of them, all of the tautological bundles, and it turns out that uh, it turns out uh, that uh, the eigenvalues of operators of quantum multiplication uh, they are uh, they correspond to uh, they evaluated the solutions of the x x z beta equations and the eigenvalues of this operator they are completely they they correspond to um, you know the eigenvalues of the transfer matrices right so uh, and this is related to what Mina said so the Baxter Q operator is just formed it's just a generating function for the exterior powers of the tautological bundle right on this diagram. So this is what I wanted to say about it, and I probably not going to return to it only slightly in the talk uh, to the enumerative part. Uh, now, what I want to talk about is something what enumerative part doesn't catch. And this is related to QQ system. This is uh, the central part of our author uh, approach. So this is what it is. So it's another view on beta and that's if you like. Uh, uh, what you, uh, how you obtain it in the first place uh, from representation theoretic part. So you uh, try to solve the question which I addressed earlier, how to interpret Q operator using, uh, you know, representation theoretic approach. So, uh, what you look at, you extend, instead of taking the representations of the full uh, quantum algebra, you're looking at the representations of the barrel, because remember we are taking the trace of R matrix and R matrix belongs to uh, B plus cross B minus, where B is uh, are the barrels, right? So you can, in principle, uh, consider representations of the barrels subalgebra, taking traces there. So uh, what it leads to, it leads to the fact that there are two such uh, representations corresponding to Q operator, and if you would like, it's dual, right? So you have a operator Q, operator Q tilde, and they satisfy the equations of the QQ system. Now, uh, imposing some non-degeneracy conditions, so here Q and Q tilde, now think about it as equation for the eigenvalues. So if uh, their roots are distinct and they're distinct from AI, so this functional equation is uh, equivalent to Betanzas. Right? And here is, this is for SL2. Now, generic form of the QQ system is uh, like that. Uh, so the number of Q operators is exactly the rank of your uh, original algebra G. Now, C tilde and Xi, this is, uh, they're somehow related to Z. Um, I don't want to describe the details. Uh, and this is what you, you see in the right-hand side. So here I want to make a distinction. There is Q minuses and Q pluses here. So Q pluses are our original Q operators, which uh, you know any transfer matrix can be described in terms of those. Uh, Q minuses they 
kind of look as auxiliary uh, guys in there, but not quite. So in, in principle, as you will see, you, you will be able to interchange them in principle. Right? And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between solutions of the QQ systems and beta ansatz equations. So for a long time, we actually tried to uh, uh, reproduce a QQ system from enumerative, using enumerative techniques. Unfortunately, it didn't work. So it's an open problem. Maybe it's possible. It's partly related that Q plus and Q minus, they live in kind of different spaces, if you like. Uh, and uh, somehow this is this is an open problem. So maybe maybe using enumerative technique you can reproduce uh, QQ system. Okay. So what it has to do? So what what we're gonna do? We're gonna uh, give a geometric interpretation, completely different geometric interpretation of this QQ system. Okay. So to do that, let's go in the past and let's look can at some. Can you comment on small b, please? Sorry? Can you Sorry? comment on small b? Ah, yes, a good. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. So small b, uh, uh, well, it uh, it gonna vary. So in in the case of uh, uh, in the in the simply laced case, it's it's particularly simple. It's non simply laced case. Uh, it's gonna be a little more complicated. And in fact, in non simply laced case, there will, there, there will be a deviation. From uh, you know between QOPERS and uh, standard QQ system um, related to beta ansatz. So uh, let me let me not completely respond to that question now, and I'm gonna return to that later when we when I'm gonna write it down more explicitly. But yes, there is there is a, a deep issue about those Bs in there. Is there a corresponding equation with Q plus and Q minus exchanged? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. In fact, it's related. So uh, to open you uh, sort of the mystery, so Q plus and Q minus are exchanged when you change stability parameter. When you change stability parameter in Yonakajima variety, uh, it corresponds to somehow like pain reflection, right? Say in T star Grassmannian, you, you will have uh, uh, Grassmannian Kn and Grassmannian N minus Kn. So uh, this is what it corresponds to. Okay. And and how about the AI AIJs? What what's that? Ah, this is Cartan matrix. Sorry, ah. I, I I yeah, this is Cartan matrix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me let me bring you back and let me discuss Gaden model and um, Opers. Uh, so I I try to be brief in here, but uh, nevertheless, this is this is important subject. So you can consider the classical limit of what we considered here. So you can take your R matrix and uh, uh, take a limit taking you know our quantum parameter h bar and you know linearize it somehow and uh, do the same with uh, that weighted r matrix which we took trace of we denote it as m because usually it's referred to monodromy matrix and uh, uh, what happens is that our rtt relation which R M M relation, which uh, was before, now it's replaced with this relation with the classical R matrix, and you can obtain uh, what is known as Gaden Hamiltonians uh, in this way from uh, this new operator L. So uh, what Edward did uh, is uh, this one-to-one -one correspondence between the spectrum of Gaden model, the spectrum of these Hamiltonians. Uh, and uh, connections on, on P1 of special type, so that uh, the corresponding uh, uh, group, in the, in the principal bundles where the connection lives, is Langlands dual, right? So he did it in the case uh, Z equal to zero, so that, that this Z, curly Z, which is in there, it's related to that Z we had before. It's sort of the classical limit of, of that one. Uh, but it can be generalized. It can be generalized to the, the non-zero, uh, the non-zero case. So uh, yeah, and I have to say, and I have to say here. So these connections have regular singularities in z equal to zero case. But when z is not equal to zero, at infinity you have non-regular singularity. You have a double pole. So basically, on CP one, your connection uh, is uh, it will be gauge equivalent to. Uh, to constant connection and when you make a transformation you acquire the double pole 
and make it a transformation Z to one over Z. Okay. Uh, now, what are the roots of this correspondence? So to, to find those roots, you have to look at the classical Knizhnik symbology of equations. Here they are. So here K, parameter K, uh, it is the central charge of the uh, affine algebra. So before we were considering, we were considering just the, the, the loop algebra without a, a central charge. So when you talk about Knizhnik symbology of equations, you have to, you have to look at uh, introducing central charge and what you write your equation for is uh, these are conformal blocks for uh, affine algebra. So you you take a bunch of intertwiners, uh, linguistic intertwiners for uh, affine algebra, and uh, this is the equation they satisfy. By the way, the analyticity region which I wrote here it comes from uh, it doesn't come from conformal blocks. In fact, this is a kind of recalculation more close to enumerative geometry. So important facts in here, which uh, which you probably notice, so the, the 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 classical limit when k, so here classical limit. Uh, remember we had q go to one. So here when k is uh, approaching minus h uh, hat, which is a dual Coxter number, you have again eigenvalue problem for uh, Gaden Hamiltonians. Uh, so this is a relation to Knizhnik symbolic equation and. Uh, here are two important papers, which uh, I think are crucial in understanding where it all comes from. So first of all, uh, the first paper is, uh, it's about the center uh, of uh, affine algebra, but it's isomorphic to uh, gelt and Dicke algebra, it's a Poisson algebra, by the way. And uh, uh, this is an algebra of these connections, operas, on punctured disk. And this is a classical limit of what is known as W algebra. Uh, now, another paper uh, by Hagen, Penkel, and Tichin, uh, this is explicit construction of eigenvectors uh, of uh, Gaden model and uh, solutions of KZ equations, somehow I mixed it all in one sentence, uh, uh, using Wakimoto models and beta equations for Gaden models, they are obtained by what is called Miura transformations. So what it leads to eventually, what it led to eventually, it, it led to, and I will give, I will give the example which I um, talked about here, uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence between um, Oper connections and uh, Gaden model. I will give uh, the example in, on the next slide. But first, I want to say what it corresponds to now, looking at it from a modern perspective. So uh, what it states, there is a quantum Langlands correspondence between conformal blocks for W algebra corresponding to Langlands dual algebra and uh, a witten model, so conformal blocks for a fine algebra. So uh, when you look at W algebra conformal blocks, in a particular case of SL2, where W algebra is Virasora, you have uh, what is known as BPZ equations, which in that limit, which I uh, discussed when uh, central charge goes to minus dual Coxter number, it leads to the, the, the following second order differential operator with singularities. Now, that operator can be obtained in a standard way from uh, the connection, uh, SL2 connection. Uh, and uh, this is very straightforward. You just consider the uh, linear linear problem for this uh, first order operator and you obtain the second order, um, the second order one. So uh, the point here is that uh, CIs over there, CIs, they are, they correspond to the eigenvalues of the Gaden Hamiltonians. And uh, WJs here, they satisfy beta equations for the Gaden model. And this is, uh, this is important condition which you have to impose. This is important condition which you have to impose and it follows from the fact that this connection over there, uh, it has uh, zero, zero monodromies. It is uh, you know, H equivalent to, uh, in the case Z equal to zero, it's, uh, it's completely H trivial, right? And, uh, in general, the process how you obtain those uh, differential equations, of gel differential equations, which 
conformal blocks of W algebra satisfy the classical limit. This is known as the implicit allow of reduction. Right? So this is an elementary example of that. Right? Now, what happened uh, later, quite recently, uh, in 2017, Nina, Edward, and Andre, so they introduced a QD form version of uh, this correspondence. So now you, you talk about the conformal blocks between uh, you know, a fine algebra and uh, W algebra. And uh, conformal blocks for a fine algebra, they satisfy the QKZ equations, which you have seen before. And conformal blocks for W algebra, they satisfy some difference equations, which unfortunately we still don't know all of that. I mean, it's, it's kind of an issue there because conformal blocks for uh, this deformed W algebra, uh, there, I mean, for the first time, I think it was, they were written in that paper of 2017. I mean, Mina can correct me on that, but I, I think it was like that. Uh, and uh, now the question is, so this, this conformal blocks for W algebra, it is satisfy certain difference equations. So what is geometric meaning of those equations? And this is a question, uh, this is a question which uh, Igor, <laughs> who was present <laughs> there <laughs> in, the, in the quantum clinic zomology of equation, as frankly, the equation, this is the, the question which Igor could ask Herbert easily on the part. Uh, what is the geometric meaning of the, these different equations which we have um, when Q goes to one? Um, yeah. So, so just, I, I think before our paper, there was no statement about relation of conformal blocks of WZW to W algebras, even in the underform case. One had to understand the first the deformed case before you could, in retrospect, it's obvious, but before it has not actually been done, so. Ah, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I uh, totally agree. Actually, I started studying this, this subject after I looked at your, your paper and I started rewinding it all <laughs> how it goes. So my historical references would be, you know, um, not accurate. Uh, so, all right. So that's what we're going to seek. Uh, that's what we're going to devote ourselves to. So before that, let me just say what happens in this classical case. So this is what I wrote here about. This is a classical QP system. So here W stands for the Vronsky and uh, well, there is extra part related to uh, presence of Z in there. And then there is a right hand side. So it turns out that uh, it was first observed in the SL2 case that uh, uh, Edwards uh, connections, they can be written explicitly using this uh, QQ system, classical QQ system. And uh, Edward proposed that we write about it explicitly for, for the, this classical case, and we're gonna do that. Uh, and uh, well, what we will what we will see is that you can easily deform this formula. Not not easily, but you can deform this formula. And actually, the uh, all the statements they become uh, in a way uh, easier, like it was uh, like it was in the in the case of Q Langlands. That the, a lot of things be, become easier when you deform things, right? So, uh, so the, uh, Anton, the perspective in our paper is that. While we didn't write down the equations that double algebra conformal blocks satisfy, we, we showed an explicit correspondence between one and the other, uh, right? So at that point, which is which somehow stronger, right? Because instead of- No, but we are solving the different saying, problems. Well, I have two equations whose so spaces of solutions in some way correspond to each other. You actually have an explicit correspondence of solutions. Yeah, then, but we are solving a different problem there. We, we are solving a different problem. We are finding geometric interpretation of uh, these two different equations. Proposed sure, to be no, that, that is, that, absolutely. I'm, I'm not taking anything away from yeah. that. That's definitely an, an important question. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so that, that's, uh, in fact, we don't know those two different equations explicitly. We don't know as far as I understand. We, we, we cannot write them down, but. Okay. Yeah. How hard it is to go from a linear equation to a, to a higher order nonlinear equation? I don't know. I mean, well, it's, it's, it's because some of them they have pseudo differential, huh? and they will be deformed. So it's kind of. Can you say this? They have pseudo differential. Pseudo differential. Pseudo differential. 
we're, we're just. What's this? Okay. Uh, I'm just, okay. So it's, I mean, in the case of SL2, yeah, you take a fundamental representation, you, you know, you apply it to connection and it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really easy or in the case of SLN, but in uh, other cases, it's, it's quite hard to pass from one to another. So, and it's definitely not easy to read it from conformal block. So in, in a way, it's, it's, it's a completely different problem here. So I'm, so you're, you're saying if I give you a linear difference equation of some uh, that, that it's it's hard to find a corresponding nonlinear difference equation? I don't quite understand. So here we have a connection. Uh, so in what happens in the classical case, we have a connection of this kind, right? Uh, now the point is that somehow this connection is related to that uh, differential equation which conformal blocks satisfy, right? So this process is called, uh, you know, then it's a call-off reduction. This is how you pass from, uh, you know, the differential operator of this type to the um, to the scalar differential operator, to the gelfand dicke differential operator, if you want. Right? So you consider, I mean, you can, in, in the simplest case, you just consider a linear problem, right? For apply it to a vector, right? And <laughs> the top component gonna satisfy you. Okay? Uh, a certain uh, end order equation, right? So the, the point here is to repeat what uh, Edward did in, uh, you know, in this classical case, uh, tr try to find the geometric object corresponding to those difference equation, right? So that's, uh, that's sort of a different story there. So, it's, uh, so let, me, let me try and explain how, how it plays out, how, uh, how it works. So let's discuss H connections on P1. So I was supposed to name them Q connections, but Q is reserved for, you know, Keshnik's homology, so the H connections. So you have a principal bundle and you have a multiplicative action. In principle, you could have additive action. It's gonna change things a little bit and that would correspond to you know, the additive form of everything what we did before. Uh, quantum group will be replaced with Yang and so on. So, uh, so and, uh, here is a notation that uh, we can pull back using this action. And uh, then you can define uh, the meromorphic GH connection is an element of home over here. Right? And uh, what happens is that you can trivialize this bundle on uh, certain uh, Zariski uh, dense open set U and the corresponding shift, right? So that eventually you're going to have uh, an element of G of U, right? Just if you, if you have troubles with, uh, you know, the, uh, general algebraic group with coefficients in rational functions. Just think about SLM and uh, just coefficients. Coefficients in geometrics are represented by rational functions. And uh, when you change your trivialization, your connection, uh, your view is an element of home. It satisfies, uh, it satisfies uh, this transformation property that uh, there is a H gauge transform, which generalizes, generalizes a standard gauge transformation of a connection. Right. So this is the H connection on P1. And uh, well, let's describe what is H upper connection. So this is a triple. So now you have uh, this G bundle, you have a meromorphic uh, GH connection over P1. And then there is a reduction of this bundle to B minus. B minus is the barrel subgroup, lower barrel subgroup. So, and now comes, this is a sort of a complicated thing. So uh, this upper condition, so where, uh, where this A lies, so it lies in the following, in the following space. So you have uh, here B minus C, B minus, where C is a Coxter element. In the case of SLM, uh, just for you to see the perspective, uh, if you 
uh, order your Hoxter element, namely the product of all uh, simple wave reflections, if you put them in a particular order, you will have uh, generally non-zero elements above the main diagonal. And you have everything below the main diagonal. Right? But only in that particular order. In general, this can be you know, all twisted around and uh, kind of hard to say what, where everything can be. So on the level of uh, just local expression, this is, this is what uh, this opera connections, opera connection correspond to. Right? So this is how A of U uh, looks like. So, uh, so N prime and N, yeah. There was a question? No. I, I can hear you. Maybe you just type it or, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, in any way, so the, uh, this H over connection, uh, it has the following form. So think about N prime and N as lower triangular matrices, right? And uh, here you have this product of, um, you know, uh, simple way reflections with uh, coefficients in, in Cartan. What does reduction? To be minus, well, you have, uh, well, you have a standard G bundle, and then you have a reduction of that bundle to be minus, right? So you have a reduction of the group. Yes, this is extra data. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, this is extra data, yeah, yeah. So just keep in mind, keep in mind that that picture, uh, and uh, that was used, by the way, in '98 by Semyon Chichansky and Sevastyanov to construct the uh, H infix Kalov reduction. This particular operator we used this particular operator. Now what we're going to need is not H oper but uh, Miura oper. So this is another extra data which uh, NGU may take it as, uh, you know, an, an another piece uh, in the, in the um, construction. So now we have not only B minus reduction, but also B plus, all right? And uh, the point is that this B plus part, it is preserved, it will be preserved by our connection. So with respect to, let me, uh, explain it once again, because it's important. So we had B minus reduction with respect to which it behaves in, uh, in this way, right? So it, it is uh, an operator which has uh, the following four, right? And then there is B plus reduction, uh, which it preserves. So now the point is, of course, because we have two reductions, B minus and B plus. The question is how do they relate to each other? So let's develop uh, the notion of a relative position. So it turns out, it turns out, uh, using this construction, you can have uh, you can have uh, b minus and b plus according to Briada composition. You can have a wheel group element, uh, which uh, kind of separates them, if you like. It, it's a, a, a it's a relative position. Uh, and uh, when this wave group element is um, equal to one, it is called generic. So it means that uh, when you have these two trivializations characterized, you know, as it's written here, a b minus or b, b plus, you have an element a minus one b, which sits in, uh, you know, it, it corresponds in the in the double quotient b minus and b plus. It, it corresponds to certain wave group element. So when it is one, uh, then we have a generic relative position. So what, what it, I mean, it all seemed, it seems a little abstract. So what it corresponds to on uh, the local level. So here is uh, the first of the structural theorems for Miura uh, H workers. Uh, so it turns out that there is an open dense subset so that reductions are in generic relative position. So what it corresponds to that there is an element G of U always, which sits in the, uh, bigger cell, which gonna trivialize, sorry, which gonna bring our uh, connection to the B plus form. Now, furthermore, and this is a second structural theorem. 
So this is a, uh, the first point is immediate consequence of what I just said that you can bring it to, you know, using uh, this transformation, you can bring it to B plus form. And also, and also you can uh, describe this connection using these very simple operators expressed using uh, Chevalier generators. Alpha I check and EI. So you can explicitly, uh, explicitly write that down, the explicit form. And here, uh, uh, is there some way fixing data in order? So uh, one thing we're gonna do, so uh, we're gonna consider Z-twisted uh, geopers, and that gonna, uh, that gonna simplify things a lot. In general, it's kind of hard. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem, but we're gonna consider simplification of this, that space. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, here is an explicit expression for uh, Miura, uh, the operator corresponding to Miura order. Uh, so in the case of SL2, this is just uh, the product of Cartan element on the exponential of uh, you know, E, right? Of uh, uh, the only Chevalier generator that, that, that reads in the positive part and the positive part. All right, and uh, there are elements. So here are several elements. So GI are um, a certain rational function. Phi J is also a rational function. TJ corresponds to um, the choice of lifting the uh, lifting the weight group element into the group. Right. So we can set it to to be one. We can set it to be one. Okay. So now two important ob objects. So first is oper with regular singularities. This is something what we're gonna need, we're gonna need for uh, our construction related to what we have for transformable blocks and so on. So here our functions phi i, which are in principle rational, in principle they're rational, now we're gonna take them to be polynomials, polynomials. Mm -hmm. So naturally, uh, so any any Miura order can be written in this simple form. Right? So GIs are some rational functions. Now we say that our uh, GH order is Z twisted if it's gauge equivalent, H gauge equivalent to a constant matrix. So on the level of connections, there is a classical limit to, to connections. Uh, this Z corresponds to irregular singularity at infinity irregular singularity at infinity. If you remember that operator, which I wrote for uh, standard connection, there was this extra Z. So uh, what is written here, classically, it means that, uh, you know, you can make a gauge transformation to the constant connection so that, you know, making the transformation Z to one over Z, so U to one over U on the sphere, you acquire the, the second order of right? Okay, and, uh, when Z is regularly semi-simple, and this is what we are aiming for, because this is what we need, you know, to take the trace, this is the optim optimal choice. So there are uh, the element of Miura operas for a given opera, because Miura opera is also an opera, right? But there are several Miura operas for, for given opera, because there are several, there, there are choices you can make for um, B plus, right? For, uh, for that, uh, for, for that B plus reduction, which, which your connection preserves. So in the extreme case, when Z is equal to one, there is G mod B, newer authors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I think I said everything I wanted here. So now there are two important objects in here. So first is H connection. So let me return back to the expression for the author. So there is these GIs in here. Uh, and there is a product of them. So let, let's eliminate all, all the EIs, right? So you obtain the H connection, all right? Uh, so this is important object. When you talk about, uh, uh, when you talk about Z-twisted case, well, you see that uh, GIs, they have certain form, right? They have certain form. This is this, is this uh, they're represented using this ratio. Now, another thing, uh, let's take uh, a fundamental representation 
And let's act by this H opera in that uh, uh, fundamental representation. It turns out that the uh, first two vectors in there, so the highest weight, and uh, the action of the Chevalier generator on the on the on that highest weight. So it's going to be preserved. It's going to be preserved by our uh, order, right? And it's going to be preserved by P plus. Uh, so therefore, you have associated to every to every omega i to every fundamental representation. You can uh, you can associate uh, GL two order, the two by two matrix here. Okay. So, and this is, uh, this is important for the following. So let's remember that. So there is H connection and associated GL2. So, and now I will introduce uh, the first level of Z-twistedness. Uh, we call it Z-twisted Mura-Plücker order. And it's related why we put Plücker in there. Well, because, uh, you know, because of the standard thing and how G mod B, uh, you know, it's described using line, line bundles, using Plücker embedding, right? Uh, and here, in principle, you have, uh, you know, WI, you have, uh, you have associated bundle, right? And you have two line bundles in there. You have the line bundle corresponding to the highest weight, and there is uh, the bundle corresponding to the next element in there, right? So that's why we call it mirror Plücker. So what we say in here, that on the level of this WI space, of this two-dimensional space, it is uh, gauge equivalent to Z, only there, only there, not globally. So on every, in every fundamental representation, that uh, uh, two by two matrix is gauge equivalent to Z. So this is what we call mirror plucker uh, Now, imp imposing, non-degeneracy conditions, and I'm not going to discuss it uh, here in detail, it's related to the, uh, to, to, to the fact that you want to make this uh, GL2 opera somehow non-degenerate and H connection non-degenerate. So what it leads to, uh, it leads to the fact if you impose those completely geometric non-degeneracy conditions that those functions YI, which contributes to GI, they become polynomial not necessarily rational. The polynomial with certain uh, conditions uh, that, uh, you know, yi and yj, they have, uh, uh, they have distinct roots from lambda k. By h distinct, we mean that they do not belong to the same lattice, to the same h lattice. Right? And that's what it, uh, what it corresponds to. So now if we expand, if we now uh, write down the, um, the gauge transformation, which um, you know, trivializes it on WI, we can write it down explicitly just like that. Uh, and this is where Q minus and Q plus, which you have seen before, this is where they appear. This is where they appear, Q minus and Q plus from the QQ system. And uh, it turns out that, uh, well, these functions GI in, the, in our order, they can be written as follows. They can be written as a ratio of these future you know, eigenvalues of Q operators. And uh, you can write the first, the first of the main theorems. So there is one-to-one -one correspondence between QQ systems and this mura plucker operators. Right? So again, these are mirror plucker operators so far. These are not, uh, these are not um, Z twisted operators. So they are not gauge equivalent to Z everywhere. It's only, it's only in this two dimensional space. So nevertheless, let's discuss this QQ system because I promised, I promised a discussion about the QQ system. So in AD case, yes, this QQ system corresponds to beta ansatz, uh, beta ansatz, which we know and love. This is exactly beta ansatz equations for, for G. Now, what happens in a, a non simply laced case? So currently it's under investigation. So originally it was, uh, uh, you know, it was thought that it corresponds to the twisted affine algebra. But uh, now there is some, some new data. And uh, uh, if Edward wants, he can discuss it uh, later uh, in, you know, in the maybe discussion session. 
Uh, so, but in ADE case, it, it is indeed, it indeed corresponds to the beta ansatz equations. So there is one-to-one -one correspondence of this PT system to beta ansatz equations. And uh, what I wanted to say, uh, and also another thing which I didn't mention here on the slide, that it doesn't depend on the order. Remember, actually nobody asked me about the order in which I took um, this uh, product of uh, value reflections, right? When I discussed my upper condition. So it turns out that the QQ system doesn't depend on that order. Mm -hmm. Even not in the, in the non-simply laced case. Okay. So this is the first theorem. So this is just beta ansatz equations written using the QQ system. I just decided to write them down and uh, they're kind of not nice, right? I mean, QQ system is much nicer uh, as an expression for the beta ansatz, much nicer. Uh, okay, so now uh, there will be strange neural plucker operators, right? So now I want I, I want to find a way how to how to bring it to Z twisted. So how when mu this Z twisted neural plucker operators when they completely Z twisted. So you actually can construct that transformation with, which brings it to Z, which brings it to constant Q connection. So, and here uh, we have a little help from uh, Mukhin and Varchenko. So they actually, the first ones to consider this kind of operators. And uh, what they introduced, they introduced something what we call now uh, quantum background transformations. And this is exactly what Nina asked before. Can you exchange Q plus and Q minus? So there is a transformation, each transformation, which allows you allows you to uh, exchange Q plus and Q minus. And that, uh, in fact, also corresponds to the reflection of Z. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is what it, what it does uh, with uh, our QQ system uh, in general. So what uh, this is explicitly in terms of um, variables, Z variables. Right, so uh, and when you transform it, uh, well, uh, something happens when you uh, you want to have your non-degeneracy condition. Remember that I originally I required uh, this Q uh, polynomials, right, to have certain non-degeneracy conditions that they they have they don't have uh, uh, common common roots when they are between the action of blinking diagram, for example. Right, so you have to put this requirement somehow. If you want to proceed and obtain better and that equations, you want to put that requirement in place, and that leads to the following genericity condition. So when you make these transformations one by one, and you keep your non-degeneracy conditions, we call it well I1 IK generic. If you make a lot of these transformations, Anton, can you just repeat what transformation are you doing? It's a little fast. Ah, okay, so let me return back and uh, uh, do it once again. So when we do this backlog transformation, when you exchange Q, Q plus I to Q mi minus I, so you just do one, uh, one change. This corresponds to the V reflection on the level of Z. So this, this is something what you do at, at, at the same time. So you, are, you, you return back to to the upper, but with Q minus and Q plus exchange, beta equations do not change. But in order to, in Can order you to- remind me, uh, so you, you, you have one Q upper for each uh, node of the, uh, of the, of the Dinkin diagram? So I is the Dinkin diagram index? No, 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 one Q polynomial, one Q polynomial for What's each- What's the I index? Uh, you see, it, so I here is A of U, a of u is this product, gi alpha hx, yeah. right? And each gi is a ratio of two q pluses, right? So okay. i runs from one to r, where r is a rank. Um, uh, um, sorry, you were, you were muted. Okay. So r is the rank of G, G, the glr or something? Oh. R, yeah, R is a rank of our algebra, yeah. Okay. 
and we are yes. just using acid. As, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So this is uh, so this is a transformation. So we just exchange one Q plus by Q minus. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, once you change that, well, you have another Q minus in place, right? So you, when you exchange Q plus and Q minus, there is another Q minus, which we call Q minus tilde. And if you impose, if you impose non-degeneracy non condition every time you do this transformation, well, you, you obtain the same, the same beta equations every time for the new QQ system, right? So uh, when we have uh, when we have w zero w zero is uh, the longest the longest such transformation, so we're gonna call we're gonna call the corresponding generic object w generic. Now the claim is the claim is that uh, this w generic is a twisted neural Bloch operator. So remember that condition which we put only on every two by two block, right? So then it turns out that the corresponding copper will be the twisted. So there exists this gauge transformation which brings it to the constant, to the constant uh, element Z. Right? And the proof here, so it involves with playing with double bra cells and uh, not a big play, but I want to underline here something. So uh, this, uh, the whole this subject, it, it is related to, um, geometry of double Brewer cells, and later it becomes more transparent. And uh, what Famin and Zelivinsky did with double Brewer cells, and it's related to cluster algebras and, and so on and so on. Uh, so it's not uh, sort of, not the first time we can see that. Okay, so let me explain how it works for SL R plus one operators. So it's, uh, you know, so far it was a uh, general case, and uh, we didn't play with matrices that much. So let's, let's look what happens in the SL uh, R plus one operators. And here I want to pick a particular order. That particular order, which I re referred to, that uh, our, our SIs, they are ordered in such a way that our oper is sort of sitting the, uh, just above the main diagonal. So our lambdas, which correspond to the regular uh, Singularities, they just sit above diagonal. So this is a QQ system in uh, that case. This is how it's written. And uh, there is a particular easy way to write down the backlog transformations. Uh, this is just a really nice system. And the way why I wrote it down is the following. So these are backlog transformations which go one by one, uh, one after another. Uh, so this is not just random backward transformation. So what it corresponds to, so SLN is kind of specific case where you can actually have explicit, explicit expression for that um, transformation which uh, sort of diagonalizes A of U. So these uh, fractions, they are constructed by in the denominator you see Q pluses, but in the numerators you see uh, the Q minuses, which were backlog transformed many, many times. And this is, this is a very uh, particular case. Here, it turns out that W0 genericity is not needed. My suspicion is that W0 genericity is not needed in a general case as well, but we don't see it yet. But in SLN case, it's very transparent and you can actually write down this uh, diagonalizing transformation. Right. So I wrote all these complicated equations just for the sake of, for the sake of uh, you seeing that there is explicit operator there. Uh, okay. So let me now explore more this SL R plus one case and uh, give you another definition of uh, H oper. So uh, remember that I specified already the order of uh, how SIs are positioned with respect to each other. So you can think about an oper as the flag of subbundles, as a flag of subbundles. It's a complete flag. And uh, here I make a slightly non-natural ordering, but uh, 
it's just needed for the matrices to be written properly. Uh, and you, you just uh, write down your connection, uh, your uh, edge connection as a home. So that it satisfies two conditions. So you jump from uh, one space to another uh, when you act. And uh, there is again, uh, as I used to open set, where uh, each AI is uh, isomorphism on certain, uh, on this set. Now this is GL oper and SL oper. You just uh, require the determinant uh, condition, and you introduce regular singularities as uh, these induced operators A i bar. Uh, just they are allowed to have zeros. Right? Um, so with SLN, it's a little bit gruesome. So let me give you the uh, SL two example how it works for SL two. So here you have ambient space E, right? So the, the flag of bundle is considered just of E and L. And uh, the point is if you have regular singularities, so you have induced operator, A bar. Uh, so this is isomorphism except for uh, zeros of lambda of U. Right? And uh, if you have Z twisted condition, well, it's gauge equivalent to Z. Now, equivalently, you can write it down as H Bronskian condition. You can write down that uh, regular singularity condition as a Bronskian condition, which is written over here. This is H Bronskian condition. And, uh, well, if we choose trivialization of the section S of U, which is present there, so S of U is a section of uh, my line bundle L we obtain that this condition is equivalent to the QQ system. So this is another approach to uh, something we, dis we discussed before. So before we were obtaining this QQ system from, uh, you know, with the twisted neuro Plucker condition and so on. Here we uh, impose conditions on the, uh, the section of uh, my line bundle in this flag. And uh, this QQ system appears as, you know, the kind of, just directly from the opera condition, from the Vronsky. Right. So that can be generalized. That can be generalized to SLN case. And uh, in this case, you again look at the section uh, S of U. And uh, this uh, determinant which is written there, what it corresponds to. Remember that Miura opers, they uh, correspond to two flags. So one flag, uh, it, it corresponds to two uh, reductions, B minus and B plus. So in this flag language, there are two flags. One flag uh, generated by this section of the line bundle and application of the connection there, which is denoted as Z in here, because you can, we already impose a condition that it can, going to be gauge transformed to Z. And another flag, which it preserves, is just you can, you can talk about its basis is uh, just elementary basis vectors, right? E1, E1. Now, the open condition going to be just uh, conditions on those determinants, that those determinants are equal to, you know, certain polynomials where Ws here, W's, they correspond to the zeros of Q, Q minuses, of Q, Q pluses, sorry. And you can identify the backlon transformed, the backlon transformed uh, Q minuses with other minors. So this is, what is written here is a kind of uh, principal minors. But uh, when you do a backlon transformations, what you do, you're gonna just interchange rows and columns. And uh, well, all this backlog transformed QQ system, it, uh, well, it's just uh, all, this, all these relations, they just uh, correspond to the relations between minors uh, in the matrix. And that's something what cluster algebra people knew for a very long time. They used these transformations a lot. And uh, here is another, another relation to uh, what uh, Pamin and Zelivinsky did uh, 
Greenstein from Minus Levinsky did uh, with uh, generalized miners. So I'm claiming that this is not unique for uh, SL R plus one. So in principle, this construction can be applied to any, any Lie algebra. So there is a big interplay between QQ systems and cluster algebras, where backward transformations can be treated as mutations of the cluster algebra. Okay. Can you once more time say what are the two flags? I mean, who is preserved, who is not preserved? Ah, so you see that the connection, uh, the connection here is represented by the constant matrix Z. So Z definitely preserves the flag uh, generated by uh, E1, EN, right? On the other hand, you have uh, another flag with respect to which uh, you have an upper condition. And this flag is generated by S, then application of your connection to S, and then application of your connection to that, and that, and that, right? So this is another flag, which with respect to which you have upper condition. So I think I'm confused about the following in general. Mm -hmm. So you have connection which includes uh, Qs, and you have constant connection, I mean, Z, 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 diagonal Z connection. Is it like two different things or? No, but the point is that we, we, have, uh, we have a condition that um, our A is gauge equivalent to Z. This is the twisted condition. Right? So there is a gauge transformation which brings your connection to constant, right? To constant value. Okay, let's bring it to constant. Where are yeah. Qs? And then your section, your section, S of U, this is some, uh, I mean, on the level of, uh, you know, concrete data, this is just a column with polynomials, right? Right, you have section, uh, so... Yes. Well, in your, in your data for OPER, where was section then? Well, you had bundles. Know? You had bundles and you had conditions on bundles. So you have uh, the connection, the connection uh, A acting on Li, you end up in Li minus one, and then you had the condition that uh, Ai bar, right? It kind of jumps the row every time, right? So when you act by your connection uh, on a section of the line bundle, you kind of, you jump one row up. No, so I'm, I'm, so in your definitions, triple A, E, and L, right? So I don't see the word section there, whatever. But you can pick a section, just pick non-zero section in L1. Here it's uh, LR, LR plus one, the last In one. LR plus one, yeah. Well, but, but section is for blocks are Q functions, so should I pick them because I, I feel that. The... So section, I will be blocks are Q functions. Uh, well, components. Right, of, only uh, only in SL two case. So in order to construct. In no, in SL as well, but uh, uh, but I just don't understand in which sense do you want just to pick them. I felt I, I felt like it's part of your data in some sense. No, 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 no. You, you you have a line bundle and you can have a section of line bundle, right? Which generates uh, this line bundle over CP one, right? You have a. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. So one flag is given by, uh, you pick a section, then you translate it to give you one flag. And another flag is just your basis. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and you have this, uh, this interesting uh, story about uh, miners of with Ronskians and the relations between them. It turns out that these transformations which we did, these are the transformations which cluster algebra people uh, do all the time. Okay, so now I want to describe some applications. So uh, maybe Peter already gave a talk at this seminar before, but nevertheless. So for this uh, SLR plus one workers, so you can actually write down, let's write down this explicit section and let's write down the elements of the section in terms of this backward transformed uh, operators. So an interesting case happens when uh, all these polynomials in the section, they are of degree one. And only uh, lambda one, so the singularities uh, occur, the regular singularities occur only on the top, the element one, two in the matrix. 
And then you can make the following identification. If you identify the roots of uh, this, uh, you know, matrix elements of the section with momenta, and uh, you identify uh, the fractions of elements of Z with coordinates, it appears that the space of functions on uh, the corresponding mu uh, orders uh, they correspond to space of function on the intersection of two Lagrangian subvarieties in trigonometric Rudiner's uh, Schneider phase space. So that beta equations correspond to the conditions that the Hamiltonians of Rudiner Schneider system uh, they are fixed, and you fix them by uh, you know some symmetric functions uh, of AIs. Uh, the natural question, of course, will be um, what happens if uh, as i's, they are not of degree one. Well, in that case, you have some more complicated system, but uh, in fact, this is how we uh, this is how we actually discovered the the, the relation of uh, the whole this thing to workers. We we were looking at this quantum classical duality, the duality between between both equations and uh, the kinematic regional Schneider system, and. Uh, Eventually, there was a certain relation of Q with H deformed determinants and so on, and immediately there was an intuition that it should correspond to some other condition. So it's actually where it all started, um, in fact. Uh, so this is one application. Now, uh, you can generalize this construction with uh, SLN operas, you can uh, put R to infinity. That's not no problem at all. We know how to operate with completed GL infinity. So we complete our SLR uh, to GL infinity in such a way that uh, you complete the upper barrel and you leave lower barrel to be like finite, something finite. So that uh, your operator representing your Mura oper, well, it has this form. So uh, again, this is a standard ordering. So you have infinite diagonal and infinite number of lambdas above diagonal. For that, you obtain now infinite dimensional QQ system. Right? Now, if you impose periodic condition uh, of the following kind, this is a periodic condition, right? where V is a transformation uh, just moving uh, all your elements uh, one up and one, uh, how do you say, by, by uh, just, just a transformation of making thinking diagram shift, right? Because in A infinity, you can shift it. And this is, uh, this is uh, so in parallel with what happens on the geometric side when you relate A infinity quiver to uh, the one loop quiver, right? The instant on spaces. Uh, and uh, eventually, if you make this um, periodic condition, so that QQ system which you obtain, it corresponds to beta equations for uh, toroidal algebra. And these are beta equations which you obtain from the study of, uh, you know, instant on spaces, Hilbert scheme, and so on. So this is, uh, this is kind of new development and it's gonna be, hopefully it's gonna appear in a couple of weeks. Uh, so it turns out, and it's completely not, it's, it's not clear uh, what kind of uh, object uh, it corresponds to on the level of, if you return back to uh, q -Lang lens. So now you have q -Lang lens for uh, toroidal algebras, I guess. Uh, and uh, well, it sort of goes beyond, uh, beyond the, standard, the standard narrative. But uh, again, this is like the first step towards it. The only thing that you don't have here is, uh, so to this um, in infinite, infinite operator, if you like, you cannot associate to that a scalar um, Q difference equation in some natural way. It's uh, kind of hard. So the, the only thing that you have corresponded between QQ system, better equations and this infinite operators. So, okay, so that uh, sort of let me, finish with uh, putting some 
open questions. So uh, first is this uh, regular singularity structure, H regular singularity structure. So uh, remember that we had this ADE uh, case, which was in line, but uh, there was disagreement between beta and that equations and uh, operas, uh, which we had beyond the ADE case. So in principle, Lambdas can be changed, they can become rational functions, and you can, you can correct it. You can correct it by rational function, but it stops being non-degenerate. So you will have poles which will, uh, which, which will be common with, uh, with uh, cues, and you can spoil it a little bit. So I'm not sure what happens there. So this is, uh, this is interesting situation. And then you can generalize it to elliptic case, no problem. So you can consider these connections not on P1, but on, on the elliptic curve. And um, there, the rationality of lambda becomes imminent because uh, there, uh, the analog of regular singularities has to be, uh, it has to be encoded by elliptic function. Naturally, for some objects, you could make a gauge transformation to make uh, this elliptic function to just isolating its uh, numerator. But that's a kind of non-natural transformation. So elliptic case should be very interesting. Uh, another thing is relation of uh, this H operas to QE IM correspondence. That's a vast topic, and uh, it's interesting where H operas they sit in there. So let me not comment on that. This is a subject of separate development, but uh, there is an open question there. Uh, finally, something what I told before, we met many times uh, double Brea cells in this talk. And uh, there is, I explained that there, there, there is a relation between these background transformations for QQ systems and cluster algebra mutations. So there's a lot to do there. And finally, I want to mention uh, something. Let me turn back to the slide we had in there. So uh, it turns out that this situation when uh, SI of U have degree one, uh, that corresponds to uh, equivalent key theory, and lambda one is, is like that. Uh, that corresponds to the key theory of uh, complete plague. And uh, it's very easy from these variables, it's very easy to see the uh, 3D mirror symmetry. So it's really easy to recalculate one variable in terms of another. Right? It was done by Peter and David uh, Gayot, I believe, in that paper. Uh, so similar story can occur in the in this case, in the case of um, toroidal operas. Even though matrices here are infinite, you may expect to have this uh, section of line bundle at infinity, and uh, you could uh, prove. Uh, mirror symmetry or self-duality, for example, for the Hilbert scheme. So by this 3D mirror symmetry, I mean, for those who don't know, it's the exchange of uh, uh, parameters AI and parameters Z. And uh, this is very, very much possible that it's, uh, it could be done using uh, this H operas and their Vronskian interpretation, right? So let me stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, you, it, it must be related to Neckersov's QQ characters, right? That I'm not sure. That I'm not sure. It's. Uh, Kind of, it was a matter of discussion, but I'm 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 not completely sure what is the relation. Yeah, so, I believe they have some way to get Q minus from this uh, origami construction, but uh, they don't didn't explore it uh, too much. Like there's like a comment in their paper. Yeah, yeah I believe I believe Nikita gave a talk uh, maybe two or three years ago about this QQ system emerging from from his concept. But I, I'm again I, uh, I I I cannot I cannot say more about it. I I didn't do it. So, I mean, I, I think to understand that this, this issues with non-simple list cases, the, 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 the most 
straightforward way would be to understand how, how, how uh, you know, which questions in string theory your construction corresponds to. And um, usually the string theory tells you exactly what to do in a non-simple base case. In fact, we know, you know, how, how all the corresponding algebras generalize to non-simple how they non simply lay generalizations arise from string theory. So, 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 so I, I suppose the question is to first understand the rest of your story. Um, yeah, so the point that. is that this QQ system, so I, I was trying really hard to find, find out if you can reproduce it from, you know, on the AC version of uh, uh, enumerative geometry, but I uh, kind of failed. I, I don't know how to see it. So maybe, maybe Nikita's construction would do something about it. I don't know. I mean, what physics should be able to do is tell you sort of which precise questions you should be asking in enumerative geometry, for example, and be because you understand what, what these operators mean. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting question is, um, I mean, this is a proposal, what this Q difference equation um, which I started from, you know, these Q-difference equations, which, uh, you know, the conformal blocks, the Q-deform conformal blocks should correspond to. But, uh, you know, there's no guarantees here. This is a Q-deformation on the level of connections. This is a natural thing to do. But uh, there is an interesting exploration there. I mean, we know that the answer is uh, kind of in the simple list is correct. So it corresponds to the, you know, the uh, beta equations, which we know and like and so on. But uh, there is something to, to think about there. Do we have more questions? Uh, yeah, Professor. As long as, as far as the Langlands program is concerned, is this uh, all this stuff that you're talking about an unramified uh, situation here? No, but it's because uh, you did first, mention a pole of order two at one point when you were talking about that pole of infinity, and I'm just yeah, but. Uh, Listen, uh, so you Maybe have- Maybe I'm just confused about the ramification data that's coming out of this. Yes, so, uh, first of all, I mean, usually what, what Gaden model, say, corresponds to. So you have, uh, you know, some parabolic structures at, uh, you know, given points on some, you know, uh, for D model uh, over the modelized spaces of G bundles, right? So, I mean, you can, you can put different, different types of parabolic structures and you, I'm not. I'm not sure how uh, uh, how is it twisted case uh, enters there, and especially it's not clear what is what it corresponds to in the deformed case because in deformed case we don't know much, right? It's it's kind of uh, this is like the first the first non-trivial example. Right. That's what I feel. I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, go because I'm afraid to to make a mistake there. I see. Can, I, can I answer? Ah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Edward. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I, I try not to interrupt, but finally, I... <laughs> ah. um, it's no, it's just, I thought the question was kind of like just terminological questions. So, what does this correspond to? It corresponds to definitely ramified, which is tamely ramified everywhere except at infinity, which means it's regular singularity, so to speak. Yeah, but you mean in classical case? You mean in classical yes. case? So, it's a cute ah. definition of. Tamely ramified key, tamely ramified lang lens, where, however, you have one point at infinity where you have wild, wild ramification. Exactly, that's what I was not asking. Too wild, but not too wild. You know? Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Thank you so much, Professor. Of course. And have you, have you connected to, to um, uh, Vasily's work? Was, was, was it, did you end up doing the same thing or related thing or? So, from what I understood from Vasily papers, so he rediscovered neural transformation, quantum neural transformation. So, that, that, there are some other things which, which are done there, but, but it's a kind of with respect to Q-Opers. Uh, I mean, what, I mean, he wrote about them and, you know, he wrote, uh, in fact, he wrote a slightly different definition. So, this is actually something I didn't mention in the talk. Uh, so remember, I mentioned this dentil sokolov reduction, right? There is a QT deformed version of that. And uh, what it, I mean, we already have seen it. So what, what it basically corresponds to, so you reduce it to the scalar operator. But what the scalar operator corresponds to, it 
in a SLM case, it just corresponds to putting everything on the lowest row, right? So uh, this, uh, how to say, these objects which are sitting on the lowest row, they correspond to the transfer matrices, to those transfer matrices which I started from, those corresponding to the finite dimensional representation. So instead of, instead of defining it using QG systems and working for QG systems as, as we did, he decided to define it by just looking at that presentation of uh, QOPA. And uh, instead of looking at the QQ system, what he proposing, as far as I understand, is looking at something what is called TQ system. So relationship of uh, transfer matrix and Q operator, which is much more involved. And I, again, there was only like a slight hint of a definition there. So I cannot, I cannot say more about it, what, what was in Vasily's head at that time. In particular, did you connect back to transfer matrices? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yes. So this is, again, this is something I didn't mention, but we have a section in our paper about it. Uh, so we reduced it to the, to the form it's supposed to have. So this, uh, these objects which are sitting there, they're supposed to be transfer matrices. But transfer matrices, they're supposed to be polynomials, right? And we don't know what we obtain, whether it's polynomials or not. So we, we just obtained the, the proper form of this operator. In fact, it's represented using what is called Steinberg section uh, explicitly. So you, here we had uh, this, this new representation when we had this products of, you know, GIs and E to the lambda I is. So there, there is another universal presentation of this operator as, as a Steinberg section. And there are also coefficients there. And these coefficients are transfer matrices. But we, we cannot prove at least now, whether this uh, coefficients are there, there are polynomials. So in case of SLN, yes, yes. In case of SLN, it's, it's true. But uh, in general case, it's not clear. Maybe Edward can correct me, but uh, I think it's- They're not supposed clear. to be polynomials, in my opinion. What is supposed to be polynomial is the Baxter polynomial. That's why it's called Baxter polynomial, up to some scalar function. No, up to some scalar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But the formula for that, so for SL2, the, the, the basic example is SL2, where you have Q and then you have T. And T is, a, is, a, is the quantum Hamiltonian, which corresponds to the, the transfer matrix corresponding to the two dimensional defining representation. And there is a standard formula relating these operators T equals, you know, Q divided by Q plus Q divided by Q. And I mean the capital Q with shifts. And that's the standard Baxter formula. And so Q has the eigenvalues of Q on any physical space, which is more or less tensor product, say, of finite dimensional representations of UQ SL2 hat, is going to be a polynomial up to some overall scalar function. And the eigenvalue of T is whatever it is from that formula. And the fact that you have a denominator uh, to the sum of two terms where you divide by Q so you know that those poles are going to cancel and that's better than that's equation. So that's the basic picture that we know. But this is a picture on the quantum integrable system side. And uh, this point, which I'm not sure that it came across in the talk, but I would like to make it or reiterate it, is that from my perspective, at least, what this work uh, is about is about an alternative description of all of this data. So we, we already know what the quantum integrable system is. There's a lot of work on that. So the, you have the algebra of quantum transfer matrices, Baxter polynomials, and so on. And then there are spectra of those quantum Hamiltonians. But we know that, for example, in Godin model, the same data, solutions of Betan's equations, can be described by purely classical geometric objects, which are these mirror opers. So what is it? It's just a bundle with a connection, with some structures, and so on. So no reference at all to the original quantum integrable systems. It's a completely different set of combinatorial data. And what we did is we provided this type of um, classical geometric objects in the case when the Gaudin model is replaced by its Q deformation so that affine Katsmudi algebra becomes quantum affine. So there is a Q or what he, what Anton called H bar in this talk, right? So what, what, are, the, what are the Q deformed opers? I mean, 
more or less, it was clear there's going to be some Q differential equations, but what is it exactly? Because it's not just an opera, it's a mirror opera, which means that you have two reductions to Borel, which he explained, which have special properties. And so it, interestingly enough, if you define them, basically we were guessing the definition, which would somehow give us the same bet ansatz equations. But in a way we got more than bet ansatz equations, we got this QQ system. Uh, unfortunately, this QQ is too many, there's too much terminology with Qs, <laughs> this is very confusing. So uh, it's uh, Q uh, plus Q minus system that he wrote. And so this system actually has a very nice interpretation on the quantum integral system side when you have transfer matrices and so on. They correspond to specific transfer matrices, actually. And this was only, uh, you know, realized very recently. So now the same system appears from these classical geometric objects. So it's kind of nice. And, and it, 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 this Q plus and Q minus with index I, we know, it corresponds to uh, simple root. Uh, they have ni a nice interpret geometric interpretation. So that's more or less the... the what is what is happening in the simplest case now in the non simplest case think be, things become more subtle because the equations we get they are not on the nose the standard bet ansatz equation the, the equations we get from classical geometric objects called q mu q operas and so on we get a system of equations that system of equation is not the standard one so which quantum integral system does it correspond to uh it's not it's a non-trivial answer it's not quantum it's not, it's not directly quantum affine algebra but i think mina is right that it is, a, it is whatever quantum integral system that appears from our Q-deformed Langlands. But to write down the exact Hamiltonians and the physical spaces, what are they? So this actually is non-trivial. And so with, with uh, David Hernandez and Kohler Stichin, we actually have sort of a proposal now in, you know, in, a, in a new work, which is in a, as a, as a follow-up to this work with uh, Anton, uh, Peter, and Dane. And, and you get your Q over, it's only in the analog of the critical level, right? Limit. Yes, so, so this, our work is only on, at the critical level. And it's finding the class, because you have a duality of two, quantum, of two quantum field theories, really, right? So away from critical level, so to speak. And this is what we did uh, with Mina and Andre. Uh, but there is an interesting limit where this duality becomes kind of weird, where one side is quantum and the other side becomes purely classical, right? So that's what happens. Although it's not purely because, for example, there's a Poisson structure there, which kind of suggests that there is a movement away from classical there too. And so, so this is what we are focused on, we, on, on finding the exact classical objects which appear in this limit on the classical side. Where, whereas the quantum side, we know more, better because we know, at least in the simplest case, we know it is the uh, quantum integral system of XXZ type, which is associated to quantum affine, to quantum affine algebra, right? So in principle, one should be able to derive this, uh, the operas and so on, Q operas from our duality away from the critical level. In principle, right? Because as Mina, as Mina was suggesting during the talk, but I think it's rather complicated to actually do it directly. And so in any case, we, we find the answer. So without sort of going without making deformation and then coming back to this limit, but actually finding it directly in this limit. And um, there, there, um, there are two ways to introduce the non-simply laced uh, um, the, the deformation, right? Certainly on the, on the on the double algebra side. So you consider the one in our paper, and this is where the issues come come about, right? Well, yeah. I would say that uh, from the point of view of our paper with Andre, uh, so you have on the one side quantum affine at the general level, not necessarily critical level, right? So where it is fully quantum, and then on the other side you have WQT. So there are two parameters in this W algebra. And already when, when Kohler, Stichin, and I defined it, you know, many years ago, there were, we knew that some, there was something weird because there are two classical limits that it has. One of them is a, one which is well understood, which is T goes to one, where it becomes classical W algebra. It's, and it's connected to transfer matrices for UQ of G hat. But there is another limit. And so the weird thing is that one is sort of, 
is folding one. So the second limit, when Q goes to one and not T goes to one, the formulas are not for non-simple lace. For simple lace, it's completely symmetrical, but for non-simple lace, it's not symmetrical. And this other limit with Kohler, when we wrote about it in the 90s, you know, we asked the question, like, what is this? What is this object? It's actually, it can actually be defined by means of a Dirnfeld Sokolov reduction. It's that one, it's that weird limit can be obtained, that can be obtained by, by, the, by deformation of Dirnfeld Sokolov reduction. But what does it mean from the point of view of quantum integrable systems? Which quantum integrable system does it, does it serve? What's the dual quantum integrable system, right? And so that's the question. So it's really about finding, so it, it, the, it, it, what, what we did is describing the equations, the patterns as equations that come from that limit of W algebra. Okay. And Q goes to one. But then the other, the, it remains also the question of what, which, which complementable system has the same patterns as equations. And at the level of formulas, the, what the difference is that when you write the equations, so if you have AIJ in, in, in uh, Anton's formula that he showed, if AIJs are always equal to zero or negative one, there is sort of no choice. But let's suppose you get negative two, you know, like when you have non simplest case. Then you have, either you have linear term and you just take its naive square, or you take a square but with shifts by Q, so to speak, you know, so like Q inverse and Q. So that's always a dilemma that you have when you are Q deforming, that every time you encounter something which is not in the degree one, but like square, how do you Q deform it? Do you actually just take naive square or you take with shifts? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled because in, in our paper, right, we, we wrote explicit Q conformal blocks, even in a non simple lace case for the double algebra. Yes. It's not a big deal. It's, it's written there. So from that, beta antis equations follow unambiguously. Yes, I think so. I think it should, yes. So what's the issue then? So the, the beta ansatz equations are the beta ansatz equations of this limit, WQT, when Q goes to one. Yeah, this so not we can just derive them. Huh? We can just, we can just derive them. I mean, this yes, is- Yes, but you know, these equations actually, you can just find them from WQT. So it's, it's kind of like, it's built into the structure. Yeah. The issue is that these are not the beta ansatz equations, which people usually consider in quantum interval systems. They are not. And the, the, the difference between the discrepancy is what I tried to explain. The equations we get, we get sort of powers of linear factors, whereas the standard equations, which go back to, you mm -hmm. know, Akivetsky, Wigman, Rishtikin, and so on, the, back in the 80s, when they were uh, looking at uh, factorizable S matrices and so on, which kind of like the standard beta and such equations in non simply less case. They correspond to the other limit of the W algebra, when T goes to one, and that's when there is like shifts, that, uh, that you separate the roots by mm -hmm. Q and Q inverse, let's say, if it's uh, lacing number two. Whereas what you get in WQT in the limit when Q goes to one, you just get straightforward power without shifts. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Don't separate. But uh, Edward, may I comment? So uh, in principle, changing lambda, as I said, if you change it to rational function. Yeah, yeah but it's cheating. It's cheating. It, uh, I mean, <laughs> <In my opinion. laughs> it could be, so, no. Okay, so maybe there is some connection, but it's not clear how to interpret, uh, in my opinion, if you, because you can QD form in various ways. So on cl classical level, you, don't have, you, 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 you can have a regular singularity. But on the Q case, you know, your irregularity there, it can vanish in the, in the classical limit. You see, if you divide Q by Q, right? So no, but lambda is a source term. It's, it's, she agrees that it's cheating. Lambda is a source term. Exactly. So lambda is what is the regular singularity, so to speak, of this mode. You right? cannot put beta roots on set as a source term. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's unfair. Well, it means that you're considering infinite dimensional representations. For example, you could say that. So like lambda polynomial means it, it's a polynomial, polynomial, so finite dimensional representation. Yes. If you take yes. a rational function, in principle, there is a way to interpret them as highest weights of infinite dimensional representations. Um, so it's, it's possible. I, and maybe there is something to it. I, I haven't looked into it. It's a good idea. It is supposed to, I mean, the regular singularities, I mean, what, what's, what's wrong about that? I mean, if you, if you can have a regular singularities at other points, not only at infinity. I'm not sure I'm ready to discuss it now. I think there's too many formulas and subtleties involved. So I would. Uh -huh. What? <laughs> <laughs> I just pressed it accidentally. Oh, okay.
Because I'm still not understanding. You can just take our formulas and study what comes out. And if it's not what, uh, what Rashitikin and, and, and others had written down before, I'm sure there's a good reason and you're still going to get something good. I mean, exactly, but this is, my, this is exactly the point. So we get the equations that we're supposed to get, so, and, but they are not the standard equations. And of course, we will get the same equations from our work with Andrei. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, our goal in this paper was to produce these equations by purely classical tools. So define certain classical object. Classical means that there's no quantum. It's, it's like a bundle with connection, something, you know, like function. Right. An operator, they commute, everything commutes. So find some objects which are completely classical geometric objects, except instead of differentiation, you have Q difference. Find them so that the ones which have pro certain properties that you impose are precisely the same as the set solutions of, of this system of Betanza equation. And we have done that. So uh, now you're right. So, the, then the, so who, in some sense, we get a different system. Then, of course, the, the, there is a natural question. So what, what is this quantum material system? In other words, produce you know, vector space with commuting Hamiltonians so that the spectra are defined, are described by the same equations. It's not the standard one, but it can be done. So like I said, uh, this is something that I've been working on with Hernandez and Richtichin. I mean, I think this is the one sort of, in, in, in the string theory setting, right? The, um, non simply laced, uh, making anything non simply laced means introduce twist around some circle. And there are three different circles you can introduce a twist around with. Yep. Um, but I think that this is the only one that I would think that we should give something geometric and the one in our paper. Yes. And not the other two. So it should be good. Okay. I, I think so too, yes. But it's, it's an interesting observation, right? Because for many years we have had. A, a particular system of Betan that's equations assigned to a non simply Leslie algebra, right? And, and this is system of equations that is very meaningful on the quantum side because we know by name the vector spaces and the commuting Hamiltonians, namely, these are representations of UQ of G hat, and the Hamiltonians are transfer matrices. The eigenvalues are, or the spectra are, are described by a system of equations called Betan that's equations. Now, so on the quantum side, that system, that old system, so to speak, makes perfect sense. Interestingly enough, geometrically it doesn't. Geometrically another system arises, more naturally. Because you have a, you have a, like you said, I think it's exactly what you said, so that we do twisting along a, another circle or something. And it, so, so this is not the issue of, when we were writing our paper, right, there was a question that you, uh, which is, um, whether it's the Langlands dual of the, of the, of the, of right. the, of the finally algebra. So this is not, a, I would maybe that's precisely the issue or, or not. I mean, I'm sure you would know this. Yes. So I think we. I think our conjecture is correct. I think it's really the affinization of the Langlands dual of 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 G, and not twisted up fine. I, I cannot hear you, Mina. You. I'm asking whether maybe our story is definitely correct. The question is whether maybe the Rosetikins has this other interpretation of 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 U Q of G hat. That's make Langlands dual. In other words, corresponding to twisted on the Riemann circle. Not to really twisted, uh, but on that system. It is something else. So, uh, good point. So, the, uh, for, for, for non simply lays, there are many options, many other options. For instance, we can take twisted, of, uh, twisted of line also. Uh, now, the equations we get, they are not for twisted. They are not. And they are for, they are, but there is a quantum interval system which gives these equations. And this quantum interval system, should be connected to representations of GL. So it means finite dimensional algebra dual and then affinization. So non-twisted, you see what I mean? Just like in our paper. Uh, but to construct it, it's, non -tri it's a non-trivial construction. So on representations of that, UQ of LG hat, right? We already have a standard integrable system, standard computing Hamiltonians, which give the old fashioned Betten Z equations. It turns out that there is another quantum interval system on the same representations. This is now I'm sort of announcing this new oh. results, which give rise to this to this new geometric uh, Betten Z equations that Anton was describing. Okay. You see? So, so it's kind of interesting to me because you know I spent many years studying these quantum interval systems and I did not real like I didn't know what is this what is this one you know and now it's kind of and we should be able to obtain it of course from if we take proper limit of our conjecture with, uh, with uh, Andre, I think we should be able to get that. 
But the fact that for us, it's exactly that algebra, the affinization of Langlands dual, right? And you all are insisting on that. You know? right. <laughs> it's that and not twisted. So I was a bit worried about this. But now I think it is uh, vindicated, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to, I would love to understand what your formulas mean. <laughs> I guess from physics, so. As, as, as I said in the, in the first quote by, uh, by Feynman, so we try to understand it better, right? We still try. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks, thanks for everybody for joining. Good to see everybody. <laughs> see you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.